Welcome to the Lung Cancer PowerPoint. So this one we're going to talk about um, different types of lung cancer and causes and everything. So this picture here uh, that's in the background of the slide, this is looking at uh, lung cancer and this is a specific type that we'll talk about. But you're going to see a lot of lung cancer really affecting that right upper lobe. And so when you go in with bronchoscopy to go sample or to look for um, tumors or things like that, it's usually going to be in that right upper lobe that you're going to be sampling and trying to pull things from. So something to consider when we go through this. So let's get started. So lung cancer is chapter 27 in my book. Uh, so let's just start here. It's a general term that refers to new tissue growth that is progressive uncontrolled manipulation of cells, which is just like anything, any other type of cancer. It's that progressive uncontrolled multiplication of cells. And so it might be localized and, or it could be invasive. It could spread. It could, that means it could also be benign or malignant, right? It could be nothing or it could be something that does spread or results of spreading. Uh, so benign tumors, when we're looking at benign tumors, they do not endanger your life unless they interfere with normal functions, right? Other organs or affect other a vital organ. Um, every once in a while, like you could see uh, a tumor, and we've had benign tumors when we've gone with bronchoscope um, down that are closing or collapsing a whole segment of lung tissue, and therefore causing collapse of tissue. And so one of the things they might do is either put a one-way valve in there, or they might go ahead and do a lobectomy, right, and get some of that uh, segment out of there so that way it's not causing that dead space issue going on. So benign tumors can affect how someone's uh, breathing and stuff like that, but usually um, they don't affect a vital organ. In other words, like, they're not spreading to any other areas, they're just sort of localized there. Uh, so that's when they push aside normal tissue, don't invade it. Like let's say someone has a throat cancer or a tumor that's pushing against their trachea or something like that. Things like that can happen. Um, usually they're well demarcated, uh, encapsulated growth, so that's not something we have to worry about it overall. They're not invasive, they're not metastatic, they're not going to spread. They just don't travel. They just stay there. Um, and then they just have their own thing uh, in that area. So these tumor cells do not travel through the bloodstream like other ones do, or lymph tissue like the other ones do. That's one of the reasons for endobronchial ultrasound, where we actually sample the lymph tissue that's surrounding the lungs, is we're trying to see if there is anything in there that is cancerous, right? Um, so it invades secondary tumors and other organs, right? So that's one of the reasons for an EBUS there. When you're going to malignant tumors, so we just covered benign tumors, now we're in malignant tumors. Malignant tumors uh, have some primitive or poorly differentiated cells that are a part of them. And so they grow in a very random, chaotic, disorganized pattern. And they do this fast. So the nutrition of the cells becomes a problem, right? So this is where they need more oxygen or they have a high metabolic rate. And that's one of the things that we'll see with these, these um, tumors is these malignant tumors are just going to have this rapid, fast, high nutritional choir rate. Um, this can cause necrosis, ulceration, they can form cavities. Um, invade surrounding tissues, they might be metastatic as well. Uh, so these are ones that tend to grow fast and can be very affected to the rest of the organs as well. Um, they might develop in any portion of the lung, right? They're not as selective. And then they most commonly originate in the epithelium of the tracheobronchial tree, which in one sense is very good because that means as far as bronchoscopy goes, we can sort of sample it with uh, cytology, um, we can even do histology, we could even go ahead and do lymphatic tissue uh, sampling as well. So that is one benefit of that. Uh, one of the best things out there for 
lung cancer is um, low dose CT scans, and I think we'll talk about that later on. But those low dose CT scans for people that are high risk for lung cancer have been life savers because then you can catch a lot earlier than it would show up on an X ray, or in a lot earlier than it would show up in a bronchoscopy. So lung cancer, a tumor that originates in the bronchial mucosa, is called bronchogenic carcinoma, right? It or it its genesis is in the bronchi, right? The bronchial mucosa. As this tumor gets bigger, the bronchial airways become irritated, inflamed, and swollen, right? So as it gets bigger, the lungs are going to respond to this. And this means that that cellular response is going to happen too, where the alveoli are going to fill and become consolidated and collapse. And you're going to see that. Like when we talked about ILDs, there's a lot of similarities that go along here. This produces, uh, this tumor protrudes into the tracheobronchial tree that's going to stimulate the tree to make a lot of mucus to try to get rid of it. And then they might actually obstruct the airway as well. So this is something you have to be careful of. If it does obstruct the airway, A, we can sample it with a bronchoscopy, but B, we could also go ahead and go in and um, get it, to, or we could see obstructive airways with this lung cancer as well. Surrounding blood vessels will erode, so it's going to destroy the blood vessels in the area. Uh, as it enters the tracheobronchial tree, you'll usually see pleural fusions with this patient population or with this disease process. Pleural fusions are pretty common with these patients. Uh, pleural fusion further compresses the lung and causes atelectasis. So not only do they have collapse from lack of gas getting to the airways with the giant tumor, but they also have collapse from the surrounding tissue, the pleural fusions that go on, that push and cause that compression atelectasis as well. Overall, because of the swelling, because of the inflammation, because of all this stuff that's going on, that's what causes it. It's very similar to pneumonia. It's, that's what causes it to be a restrictive disorder. Now, like I said, there's things that could obstruct the airway too, like the tumor could obstruct the airway, but overall, it's going to be restrictive in nature. So alterations, inflammation and swelling, we just talked about those. Destruction of the airways, excessive mucus production, which could lead to mucus plugging, things like that. Um, so you just got to be careful with those patients. So airway clearance therapy might actually be very beneficial. Same thing with things like duonabs, things that would increase the mucus escalator, make it easier for mucus to move around, uh, make it easier for the airways to uh, have gas that passes through it, uh, those things could be very helpful. Airway obstructions uh, could form uh, from blood if it's a necrotizing, destroying blood vessels, right? Uh, mucus could form uh, or a tumor go into the bronchus. So airway obstruction can be a part of this, but remember, it's considered restrictive in pathology. Obviously, as a result of all this atelectasis, consolidation, it can form cavitations, and even lead to pleural fusions. Uh, pleural fusions can be very continuous, and that's where we might have to look at things like a pleurodesis or other things for these patients. So lung cancer patients might come in frequently with shortness of breath, chest pain, and then when we look at it in further detail, they might have a massive pleural effusion going on. So we've got to be careful. Risk factors for lung cancer. Uh, and I'm not going to make you guys memorize statistics, but uh, more cancer deaths by lung cancer than colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancers combined. Right? That's not a misprint. That is the truth. And it's one of those things that you don't see a lot of publication about. You don't see that those awareness months for lung cancer is, or as much advertised out there. As, um, to get yourself screened or prevented from it. It's just one of those big, big things that sort of get overlooked out there. The most common cause of lung cancer, cigarette smoke currently, right? That's going to be one of the big ones because this is a preventable cause. This is something that we, if we do the right education on, and kids that never smoke, right? Things like that, that could really turn the lung cancer numbers way, way, way down. So this is actually a preventable 
disease, just like emphysema, it's preventable for most cases, right? If it's the non-genetic kind, it's preventable, right? Cigarette smoking is an option, not a requirement, right? So this is one of those things where we're looking at a cigarette being the number one uh, most common cause of lung cancer. So that's something you should memorize, something that's there. Um, a lot of different chemicals that have been proven to be carcinogens. This is all open information. This isn't my opinion. This is just data that is currently out there. So take it for that. Uh, secondhand smoke. Um, people always talk about that being a myth or whatever. Um, it has shown as much of a 30% increase in the risk for lung cancer. That is evidence that's out there. That's not my opinion. This is directly sourced from your book, which is directly sourced from medical information. So that secondhand smoke, uh, even the carcinogens that are in the smoke, everybody talks about filters and all this other stuff. Uh, even just being around the cigarette smoke can increase your risk of lung cancer. And it's been associated with it as well. So uh, you can have a genetic predisposition towards developing lung cancer. And that can play a role of how quick someone gets it or if someone doesn't get it uh, as well. And we talked a little bit about that in the emphysema PowerPoint as well. Risk factors for lung cancer, environmental or occupational, uh, can be part of it. Now, let's talk about this one. Uh, the radon exposure, the evidence behind radon exposure in lung cancer is not considered in the scientific community to be very strong. Not very, not a lot of repeated studies on it. So radon thing is something that uh, happens in basements uh, of houses, and it's because all the rock and all that stuff, there's more radon in the basements, and especially basements that don't have radon mitigation systems, right? They to really pull it out of the, the areas that don't have open windows or anything like that. So just be caught cognizant that the radon uh, data is still not as strong as it could be to really show an absolute connection to lung cancer. It just needs more data ultimately. So I will leave that with you. They do consider radon exposure a, a risk factor for lung cancer. However, uh, it, from a scientific aspect, we would like to see more that would verify that relationship. Uh, other things, uh, mining, uh, radiation of a nuclear fallout, <laughs> of a fallout, of course, uh, uh, hydrocarbons and aerosols, asbestos, diesel exhaust, mustard gas, uh, especially those um, soldiers that were exposed to it, uh, nickel, silica, a lot of this you'll notice from the pneumoconiosis or from the uh, ILD PowerPoint, you'll see a lot of stuff. Uh, come back over because what's going on with your lungs? Well, there's a massive inflammatory response. Your lungs are having to make new cells. Those new cells can mutate, right? You're having a lot of stuff going on. So you'll see a lot of common things. Air pollution can even factor into your lung cancer risk. Doesn't mean it's absolute. None of these things mean it's absolute, but just factors into your risk, right? Coal mining, iron mining, those type of things will factor into your risk not an absolute, but just a higher risk uh, factor of developing uh, lung cancer. Types of lung cancer, there are two general types. There's small cell, and then there's non-small cell. So that's what you're looking at. So non-small cell lung cancer, or NSCLC, <laughs> non-small cell lung cancer, usually they're going to be squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, or what's known as large cell carcinoma. <laughs> All right, so uh, and we'll talk about all three of these. Um, so adenocarcinoma is something that's pretty big out there. And then we'll talk about small cell carcinoma. So small cell um, is uh, SCLC, is small cell uh, lung carcinoma. So this is also known as oat cell carcinoma, right? Little tiny oats or combined small cell carcinoma or mixed your small cell or and non-small cell, right? There's a bunch of different terms for that. So just be aware of it. But usually it's small cell and non-small cell is what we're looking at for the two general categories. All right, so this is something that's directly from your book. And this is just the two main cells. And if you're a flowchart person, this might be helpful. If you're not a flowchart person and this confuses you or makes it more complicated, don't pay attention to it. 
So a small cell over here on the branch on the left uh, goes to small cell or oat cell cancer, right? And it can also be a combined where they have small cell or mixed small cell, where they have a couple of different types of small cells, or they can have a small cell on top of a non-small cell, right? They can have adenocarcinoma and a small cell carcinoma all going on at the same time. So just be aware of that sort of com combined condition that can happen. So non-small cell uh, cancer on the right screen here can go to squamous cell adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma or large cell carcinoma. So those are your two branches, right? And if you have risk factors that can cross over where you can have both small cell and non-small cell. So why the labels? So each type of lung cancer grows at, and spreads at a different rate. So why? So this will help us determine how we're going to approach this uh, cancer, how we're going to treat the cancer parts uh, that's going on with this patient. So small cell is very aggressive and responds best to chemotherapy, radiation therapy. I would remember this. I will definitely ask you to remember this. Small cell occurs extremely, uh, almost exclusively in smokers and accounts for up to 20% of all lung cancers in the U.S. So this one's aggressive and the big thing here is chemo and radiation for these patients. Non-small cells, so if you want to draw a differentiation, non-small cells are common and account for almost 85% of lung cancers in the United States. Um, and so that's something that we would treat usually surgically and remove it that way uh, when we're looking at these. Uh, confined to a small area uh, and identified early, non-small cells can be uh, often, can often be removed surgically. So this is one of the treatments here would be uh, like a wedge resection or we're taking out that area that has that non-small cell cancer. So if it's small cell, usually we're looking at chemotherapy radiation. If it's non-small cell, usually we're looking at surgical removal. So th those are the reason for the labels in the situation. So therapeutically, that's the differentiation. Small cell, radiation chemotherapy, large cell, or sorry, non-small cell, <laughs> surgical removal. All right, and so this is uh, one of the, uh, uh, I think this is table 27 in your, uh, so in chapter 27 in my book. So this is one of the tables that look at the characteristics of lung cancer. And so I've just brought it over in here for you to look at. So this is non-small cell lung cancer. So non-small cell is the one that's usually treated surgically, right? And so this is what we're usually looking at, how slow or rapid it is. When we're looking at small cell, so this is non-small cell up here, and down here is small cell, right? Small cell, oat, oat cell, a very rapid growth compared to a squamous cell. Squamous cell, pretty slow moving. Usually we'll get a biopsy or we'll get it through a bronchoscopy, right? And then we'll, we're going to look at it there. Now we're going to see a lot of sputum in these uh, non-small cells, airway obstruction, usually treat it surgically. They can, it depends how bad it is, they can also treat this with chemotherapy as well if they decide to. Uh, Denocarcinoma has a moderate growth rate. Uh, uh, usually they can catch it on x-ray, uh, bronchoscopy, we can see it. Uh, this one usually is more common with pleural fusions as the presentation. Usually this is also surgical, right? Non-small cell. And then they can add chemotherapy to it, right? That's just an adjunct that they can add to it. A uh, large cell has a very rapid growth rate. So a small cell and large cell specifically have a very rapid growth rate. Uh, this one, we could see it in their sputum. We could see it on bronchoscopy. Um, and then usually this one's going to have pleural fusions, lots of sputum. So it's a combination of symptoms that we see here. One of these was sputum. One of these was pleural fusion. This one has both both of those that's going on. They'll be more recurrent with their pneumonias as well if the airways are involved. And this one is a surgical treatment, usually a wedge resection or something like that. When we're looking at small cell lung cancer or oat cell, usually uh, this is something that we'll see on radiography like a low dose CT scan. 
Uh, we can also see it with bronchoscopy, and that's usually where we do the e-bus and sample the lymph tissue as well. Uh, cough, chest pain, hemoptysis. Notice that's not in the other ones here. Goes along with this one. Very localized wheezing. Usually, um, this one's chemotherapy and radiation. Of course, we already talked about that, but I do want to stress that to you so that way you have it for future relevance. <laughs> Uh, this is the one, obviously, that can spread pretty aggressively as well. So non-small cell carcinoma. So we'll look at squamous cell to start off with. Squamous cell, usually near the central bronchus, and projects to large bronchi. You can see it on bronchoscopy, so that means we could either brush it with cytology brush or uh, use the forceps and sample it that way as well. Usually it's from the basal epithelium. Uh, it has a very slow growth rate, um, mostly hyalur lymph nodes is what you're looking at here. Uh, surgical resection is the most common thing. Treatment, uh, if the metastasis has not taken place, cut it out, right? And I think lung cancer patients are uh, eligible for uh, tr lung transplants as well, but that's a whole separate thing, to receive a lung transplant. Manifestations are non-specific. Usually, they just have this dry, non-productive cough, and then yeah, hemoptysis can go along with this because there's still destruction of airway wall. Uh, pneumonia is pretty common with these patients uh, after this starts really manifesting itself. So here's a picture that's taken from your book, and so this is looking at uh, cancer uh, letter A in the top left. It's looking at a squamous cell carcinoma. Letter B is looking at adenocarcinoma. You can see how big of a change that is, right? Where it's compressing that tissue and that can cause obstructive and restrictive PFTs as well. Uh, C is showing large cell carcinoma, sort of more peripheral, uh, not as much in the central airways. And then D is showing small cell or oat cell carcinoma as well. So that sort of, sort of gives you a visual difference between the different types of lung cancer and how severe or significantly spread it is. And so this will help you too with CT scans and x-rays to sort of help um, verify where or what type of lung cancer we might be dealing with with a CT scan. Adenocarcinoma, once again, one of the non-small cells. This is in the mucous glands of the tracheobronchial tree, so a lot of mucus production is going to go on with this, right? That distinguish adenocarcinoma from other types, right? Uh, among people who have never smoked, adenocarcinoma is the most, uh, most common form. So, never smoked, and they develop lung cancer, it's the most common one that they'll find in those patients. Tumors are usually pretty small for these these individuals. Most common found in the respiratory zone that you're looking at here. Growth rate's pretty moderate. Uh, they can metastasize early though, so if they do catch it, they want to take care of it pretty quickly. Uh, discovered early, cut it out, right? Surgical resection uh, is possible in a high percentage of these cases. Get that whole area out of there before it has a chance to metastasize. When we're going to small cell lung cancer, uh, this is the one that obviously more aggressive, more common in smokers, more common in smokers, more common in smokers, more common in smokers, uh, small cell ca lung cancer. About almost 15% of carcinomas, usually near the hyalur region of the lungs. That's why you'll see the EBUS that will sample all those lymph tissue in the hyalur regions. Usually it's in the larger airways, so this is your conducting airways. So primary, secondary bronchi, we're not going too deep to get these samples. These tumors will grow rapidly and become very large, and they'll metastasize very early on, so we want to take care of it as soon as we can. Uh, usually it will compress into an oval shape, hence the oat cell uh, term, right? Hence the oat cell term that they use out there. Um, this one has the worst prognosis, the poorest prognosis out of the different types. Survival time... Uh, 
it depends. I won't have you guys memorize this. Survival time will depend on when you're viewing this and the current data that's out there when you're viewing this. Uh, so I won't test you on that there. Uh, a lot of patients respond to treatment. Uh, like chemotherapy and radiation, remember, are the big things for small cell lung cancer. Uh, but a lot of them will relapse pretty quickly within the first couple of years of that. So small cell lung cancer has the strongest correlation with cigarette smoking and is associated with the worst prognosis. So something to remember, that's one of the reasons why smoking, besides all the lung function stuff, is pretty terrible. All right, so what will a lung cancer patient look like at bedside? What's their thing? Well, if they have it severe enough, they can have tachypnea, tachycardia, hypertension, cyanosis. All this stuff look familiar? It should, right? Because if it's big enough, it's going to cause cyanosis that causes all these back issues. Um, so hemoptysis, of course, airway wall destruction. Wheezing and crackles that are sudden onset. That's because it's going in the airway, causing a lot of mucus, depending on the kind. Worsening cough. Usually it's that dry, non-productive cough. Uh, sometimes it will have blood or rust colored. That's that, that destruction of airway wall. Chest pain. Um, of course, because the airway wall is being destroyed, that hoarse voice classically comes with all that chronic coughing and destruction. A lot of them will have poor appetite and weight loss overall. Dyspnea, fatigue is going to be one of the big ones. And then they'll get a lot of pneumonias. And that's one of the biggest things to watch out for on these lung cancer patients is the pneumonias that they are very prone to. So when this presents, the lung cancer can spread to other parts of the body. And usually, like I said here, we're looking at small cell lung cancer for the most part uh, when it's metastasized and all that stuff. Now remember, adenocarcinoma can also spread, but um, usually this is small cell that we're looking at here. Uh, usually it might have other symptoms as well, like bone pain, uh, neurologic problems too, headache issues. Uh, leak weakness, their lymph nodes might be enlarged, so that's why they'll palpate their neck and their arms in those big lymph tissue areas. Um, usually when those symptoms are uh, support uh, lung cancer, that's when they'll do a full history and physical and check for factors uh, overall that could end up leading to a diagnosis of lung cancer. X-ray, uh, X-ray usually can provide the first indication of lung cancer, it's a very common thing to get a uh, x-ray when someone has uh, breathing or cardiac issues. And so sometimes it rules out things, sometimes it rules in things, and sometimes they might catch it on x-ray. By the time it's on an x-ray, regardless of the size, it's usually invasive and very difficult to treat. In other words, it's at a very advanced stage by the time it does show up on a chest x-ray, a PA chest x-ray. So this is why one of the new things out there is going to be low-dose CT scans for people at high risk for lung cancer. See if we can catch it earlier so that way there's less of a chance of being at, it being at at such an advanced stage before it shows up. Uh, we did talk about this in the x-ray evaluation uh, PowerPoint where we talked about coin lesions. And that's what it would show up in the apices, usually in that right upper lobe, a small oval, oval coin lesion. Uh, it'll be like in a regular mass. You'll see consolidation sometimes, so radio opacities up there. You'll see some lung collapse, of course, pleural fusions may be present, so you're looking for that meniscus sign. Um, and sometimes it'll involve the mediastinum or the diaphragm as well. So those are all things that we'll be looking for. And one of the indications for bronchoscopy, for diagnostic bronchoscopy, is unexplained atelectasis. Well, that's there's a lot of reasons for that. It could be mucus plugging, or it could be something like this where there's a tumor growing in there and it's blocking off an area from getting gas into it. And it might be from a, a tumor that might not be visible on an x-ray yet. So then we could sample it. So here is a picture. Take a wild guess what type this is. This is a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the bronchus. Uh, and it can pretty be pretty big before it gets discovered. And so this person's going to notice just some baseline dyspnea here and there. And it's not something that they're going to really notice until um, later on down the road. They're going to progressively compensate, compensate, compensate. By the time they get it just checked out, this is what their x-ray may look like, right? And so that's why it's important for people 
to be identified that have high risk for uh, lung cancer that they sort of start getting evaluated for it sooner on because then we can do more. Now notice this is in the right lung. Notice that the right lower lobe here has a lot of alveolar collapse and consolidation going on with it besides the mass of the the tumor itself. So that's the atelectasis that's secondary to it as well. Uh, you have a lower meniscus sign here on both of these. Not too bad, but uh, so you can still sort of see it on this, on this patient. Uh, so this is another chest x-ray uh, that identified a su suspicious findings. So in letter A on the left, the top left there, uh, this is in the right upper lobe and it's highlighted in the center picture. You can see, sort of see the overall x-ray in the center picture and then in letter A on the left, you can see they highlighted that coin lesion. And then B in the bottom right, in the left lower lobe just behind the heart, um, you can sort of see another area that's going on. So uh, this is pretty significant. That's a coin lesion that you see in letter A and then the center area that's just showing up pretty crazy. Uh, when you're looking at a CT scan, so this is sort of that same patient, and they're looking at a CT scan. Um, so this is a CAT scan and identifies the nodules, and you can actually see the location a lot better than you can on the x-ray. So in letter, uh, not letter, in the top left, you can still see that right upper lobe. Remember, it's a mirrored image, that's why it looks the way it is, but you can see how dense that, that coin lesion is in that right upper lobe. And then the left, um, if you go down to the right, you can see how big that mass is of the left lower lobe when we're looking at that. So it gives you a lot better detail on the size and the location. So that's why low dose CT scans are actually very advantageous when we're looking at lung cancer. I love these pictures. This is a PET scan. So PET scan, this is showing a coronal view um, about the hot spots in the left lower lobe. So they put the sort of a glucose analog. That's why the brain sort of lights up when you see these areas here. That's the brain or the lower part of the brain stem. So areas of high metabolic rate. You see the bladder and all that stuff. Uh, when they're looking at the chest of this patient, you can sort of see that area that sort of sticks out uh, in that in the apice that's just sticking out. And you can see all the arrows pointing towards it. And so that's showing an area of high metabolic rate or area of high glucose, uh, glucose, um, an area of high um, energy requirements. And so that's where you would see that cancer as well. Here is also another uh, PET scan. Uh, I like PET scans. And this is a sagittal view, so we're looking at the side here. Uh, and then you can see, see the hot spots in the lower left lobe overall where this patient's developing. So this patient's faced, faced towards the other direction and you can identify it a lot better. So when we go in to do a bronc uh, in sample tissue, we know exactly where we need to go. More PET scans. Uh, this is the top view or axial view, right? Uh, so when we're looking at this, you can still identify it in the axial view on your left. You can sort of see that area that's developing and how it's posterior. So we know we want to get those posterior segments if we're going to sample anything. So this can be an advantage to us if we have to go in and do sampling. We know exactly sort of what segment or what area to go in and look for anything in the airways, especially if we we're going to take uh, cell washings or we're going to do uh, uh, brushing or forceps. Uh, this will help us sort of identify exactly what area to focus on when we're doing the bronchoscopy uh, to get samples. Uh, so this is pretty cool. I like this, showing this to you guys. I'm not expecting you guys to interpret this yet. Uh, so when we're looking at this, this is a CT scan on the far left and the CT scans sort of showing that coin lesion in that left lower lobe. Uh, sorry, the right lower lobe in that area in the right upper lobe. And so when we overlay the PET scan, the PET scan's on the far right. So you're looking at the PET scan on the far right over here. Here, let's change to a different color. You're looking at the PET scan over here, uh, you can sort of see it in that lower lobe. And same thing when you look at the, the front view, um, you can see it in the upper lobe as well. 
And then what they did here is they just overlaid, they combined the PET scan and the CT scan. So they just combined them both and overlaid them together. So that way you get a good 3D picture of sort of where it is and how involved this mass is. So that way we can get a better view of what's going on. So they do this uh, here and there. Uh, usually it's presented in color. Um, so like red is this one, but I've seen it in blue and yellow too. And you'll note that in your book as well. So CT scans and PET scan, uh, those can overlie each other, which is pretty cool. And then we can get a really good view of how big the mass is, how much nodule, what segment it most likely is, or what area to focus on when we go in for diagnostic bronchoscopy. All right, so what will the PFT look like in lung cancer? Well, it depends where the malignancy originates. It depends on the genesis, right? Uh, they may show either obstructive or restrictive values. Sometimes they could show both. This is great, right? So a PFT in lung cancer sometimes is non-specific to lung cancer. Like you can't just do a PFT and diagnose someone with cancer off the PFT anyway currently, right? If we're talking about just flows and volumes, that's not a way to sort of tell someone how it, that they have a cancer. It's a way to sort of determine the level of lung impairment from the cancer, but doesn't actually diagnose someone with the cancer. I hope that makes sense, right? So it tells you lung impairment. Right? How impaired are the lungs with this? So sometimes it shows obstructive, sometimes it's restrictive, sometimes it's both. Right? It sort of depends what's going on, right? It could be obstructive, especially when they have an underlying COPD, right? So let me ask you this. Is this a very likely scenario? You're taking care of a patient that has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease from smoking, and they develop lung cancer, which is restrictive. So now their PFT would show both restrictive and obstructive results, right? So... I know it's confusing that this could go either direction. Think about it as a restrictive disorder, but this disorder can happen on people that have baseline COPD, right? That underlying smoking etiology really makes them prone to both COPD and lung cancer. So large amounts of tissue, chest wall, or diaphragm are involved, especially with the bronchioalveolar uh, carcinoma. The pathology shows restrictive PFT value. So later on in the process on the severity scale of lung cancer, you're going to see a lot of restriction going on with these patients as well. So they're going to have low volumes and then they'll have low flow rates. So ABG is once again severity. Uh, so if they have just a localized um, lung cancer, so it's not very widespread. Uh, usually it might just show that respiratory alkalosis, like I said, that tachypnea, that baseline tachypnea, so on and so forth. If it's excessive widespread lung cancer, you could either get acute respiratory acidosis, or if they're COPD, or you could get uh, chronic respiratory acidosis on these patients. So big thing here would be that respiratory acidosis part, whether it's acute or chronic you'll see on widespread lung cancer. So once again, an ABG doesn't diagnose someone. It determines the level of impairment by the condition. Oxygenation, so what type of process is this? This is a shunt or a dead space process. Well, are we destroying the tissue or the blood flow? Well, there's a little bit of destruction of blood flow, but we're destroying the ability for gas to exchange with the tissue. So we have gas that that goes through uh, that does not pick up uh, oxygen or get rid of CO2. So this is a shunt-like process, therefore oxygen uh, therapy is going to be one of your indications here because it's shunt-like. Uh, DO2 is decreased because CCO2 is decreased, therefore CaO2 is decreased, therefore my DO2 is decreased, right? All this is decreased because my CCO2 started off low, right? It's a down still, downhill, downstream effect that we're seeing here. Metabolic rate overall, unless it's metabolized to other organs, is going to be normal. So we're talking just lung cancer here. Now I'm not talking about widespread 
uh, metastasis, and we're just talking about just lung cancer alone, their metabolic rate would be normal, or their consumption rate. O2 ER is going to be increased because our DO2 is low, and then our venous saturation is going to be decreased because our DO2 is low. Hemodynamics, uh, right-sided heart pressures, uh, so CVP, right atrial pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance, right ventricular stroke work index. All of these, well, right ventricular, so let's talk about CVP, right atrial pressure, uh, are going to be increased. Pulmonary artery pressure is going to be decreased in this case, so this is going to be mixed. So right-sided heart pressures will be mixed overall on this one. So we'll talk about that here. So what do you see with the pulmonary vascular resistance is increased? The right side of the heart is working very hard, but the pulmonary artery pressure is not. That's the only one that's sticking out here. My mean pulmonary artery pressure is low, but everything else is high. Well, why might that be? Why would my mean pulmonary artery pressure be low in lung cancer? And I am going to see if any one of you can figure this out for me. I know the answer. I just hope that one of you guys can figure out. That would be super awesome. Uh, Left-sided heart pressures, uh, either so your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, your cardiac output, your stroke volume, stroke volume index, cardiac index, um, left ventricular stroke work index and systemic vascular resistance will either be normal or decreased. So normal or decreased. Um, why is the decrease there? Interesting. Why is the mean pulmonary artery pressure low? Interesting. So based upon the stuff that we've talked about so far with these other conditions, why do you think this is? Why do you think that their, their blood pressure, their left-sided heart pr pressures, could be affected by lung cancer? Good question for you. I'm trying to make you guys think here, so hopefully you'll come up with it. So lung cancer diagnosis. Most lung cancers are not diagnosed until after the patient presents with symptoms that suggest lung cancer. Um, and unfortunately, by the time the symptoms show up, it's usually quite a, few, quite a long risk down the road unless they're undergoing routine screens for it. The primary goal of diagnosis is to confirm it, establish what type it is, and then what stage they're at. So confirm it, what type it is, and what stage that. To confirm it, what type it is and what stage they're at. So that will help us determine a game plan for the patient going on as well as their prognosis. Uh, definitive diagnosis is usually made by a, a biopsy sample, and this is where we can use the EBUS or um, an open biopsy or something like that as well. Um, but this is where you'll see us use the EBUS again as well. We talked all about it a little bit with sarcoidosis. We can also use it for lung cancer as well. Uh, and we get that tissue sample, and then we can run that. And the pathologist is usually in the room with us with an EBUS, and so the pathologist will read the slide right there. So you'll get the sample, you'll put it on the slide, you'll hand it over to um, the nurse or the pathologist, that nurse that takes it to the pathologist or the pathologist themselves, and then they'll go put it in the microscope in the room with the patient uh, right there and then they'll, they'll evaluate that slide. Um, so treatment prognosis depends on the stage and the type of cancer that that patient has. And so that's one of the big reasons why we, if you have it, uh, knowing that you have it, what type it is, and um, we can confirm the stage or level of metastasis that will help us determine your course of action. So diagnosing it, they can catch coin lesions on the x-ray, CT scans, especially low-dose CT scans, are going to be very, very useful for people that have high risk for lung cancer. PET scans, of course, we just showed a couple PET scans. Uh, MRIs are okay uh, as far as detecting this. They'll look at metastases better, but uh, for lung scans, MRIs can be blurry. Both scans, of course, can catch metastasis. Meta meta 
yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Sputum cytology, we can get it from that as well. Bronchoscopy, washing, uh, brushing, uh, forceps with a biopsy, right? Those are things we can do. Uh, EBUS ultrasound, endobronchial ultrasound, right? That's where we get the bronchoscope that has the ultrasound on the head of it. And then we could sample different lymph tissues and all that stuff to sort of get cell types and stuff on there. Uh, we could also do an esophageal ultrasound that sort of looks at it there. Um, they could actually do an open surgery um, or thoracentesis to confirm it from cells in there. A VATS procedure, right, uh, to do an open lung or a biopsy as well. So here is a picture, I believe I took this one directly from your book. Uh, when we're looking at this one, this is looking at uh, what the bronco uh, under bronchoscopy, what a small cell carcinoma looks like protruding into the airway. And this is a right main stem bronchus. Um, and then A and letter B down here in the bottom right shows a wire stent to help hold open or stent open the airway. And you can sort of see the lines of it here, the ridges of it down there. You can sort of see it at that six o'clock position too, right? So rewind it, you can look at those and you can see it in the letter B on the left here too, right? You see all these little, right? And so that's sort of a way to keep that area open because when you look at this uh, color picture that you would see in a bronchoscope, is there much air that's able to get past that? Absolutely not. And so that's going to lead to a lot of collapse, a higher chance of pneumonias and infections and all that bad stuff. So they put in a stent to help that uh, gas and air and mucus clear and get it through that area. Interventions, of course, surgery, uh, pneumonectomy, lobectomy, wedge resections are all options for non-small cells. Uh, lung cancers, radiation is more common for a sm small cell. Now remember, any of the, the non-small cells can use a combination of surgery and radiation or chemotherapy. Right, it sort of depends how aggressive and what stage they catch everything in. Is they could also do internal radiation, which is pretty cool. Uh, chemotherapy, of course, we already talked about that. Oxygen therapy for the shunt-like process. Airway clearance, especially if they they these people will be more prone to pneumonias. You get a lung cancer patient that has pneumonia that has COPD, and we're talking about a triple header of terribleness, right? So it's just a very very poor situation when you got your COPD or that has pneumonia on top of lung cancer. It's just something that is going to be very prone to a lot of difficulties for that patient. Uh, lung expansion therapy, so you're looking at positive pressure like PEP devices, anything that volume expansion therapy. Uh, bronchodilators, mucolytics as needed of course depending on what is going on with their specific presentation. All right, review questions for lung cancer. What types? What are the common lung alterations that occur with lung cancer? Hopefully you've got this in your brain. What might you find at the bedside? What would their presentation be? Would there be wheezing and crackles? Would they be clear? Would they be bradycardic? Would they be tachycardic? Would they be bradypnic? Would they be tachypnic? What would they look like? What would their chest x-ray show? What might be abnormal about a chest x-ray? What about the ABG if it's very mild or very early on? What would their ABG be like if it's very far on, well, it's at a very advanced stage? What type of process? Is this a shunt or a dead space process? What happens to their DO2? What happens to their metabolic rate? What happens? A PFT. Why would a PFT be helpful on this patient? especially if they're undergoing chemotherapy and we're looking at DLCOs, why would a PFT be helpful? Anything abnormal about their hemodynamics? What's happening with their right-sided pressures? What's happening with their left-sided pressures? What's going on with their mean pulmonary pressure? Huh. How can you diagnose lung cancer? What are some of the ways that can be used to diagnose lung cancer for these patients? Someone has lung cancer, what therapies can we use to help them? Bedside therapies, airway clearance therapies, PEP therapies. What are some overall indications? What are some overall treatments 
for lung cancer? Which ones are specific to non-small cell? Which ones are specific to small cell? What are your non-small cell types? What are your small cell types? Or idiosyncrasies? <laughs>